Welcome to the first webinar of the Heritage Science Academy webinar series hosted by the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science and the Iberian Heritage Science Project. It is, uh, I'm particularly delighted to be uh, welcoming a good colleague of mine uh, who will talk about laser techniques in conservation and heritage science, uh, Marta Castillejos Triano. She obtained her PhD in physics in 1984 at Complutense University of Madrid and worked first in Japan and in the UK as a postdoctoral fellow. In 1987, she became member of staff at, uh, the, in, at the Institute for uh, Chemical Physics, STESIC, where she was promoted to senior research scientist in 2004. She is the founder and head of the group Lasers, Nanostructures and Materials Processing. And she has many scientific interests from laser processing and fabrication of nanomaterials, application of laser-based processing and fabrication in nanoscience and biomedicine, study of matter in ultra-intense laser fields, and the development and application of laser-based techniques in heritage science, a topic that she will focus on today. Marta has authored uh, about 200 refereed publications in many different uh, journals, and she has acted as editor of many volumes of proceedings and is an active member of the Permanent Scientific Committee of the International Conference Series LACONA lasers in the conservation of artworks, but also other conference series. She supervised many PhD theses in her field of research and is extremely active in the Iberian HS and heritage science community. Uh, Marta, without further ado, over to you. Uh, you need to turn on the mic, Marta. Yes, thank you so much, Matia, for this nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it well? Yes. So thank you. I'm delighted to be here with all of you to talk to you uh, about uh, photonic approaches based in laser methods and techniques for uh, characterization and conservation of tangible uh, heritage. Mm, I'm talking about fundamentals and uh, methodologies. And uh, one would wonder what comes first, fundamental science that leads to application, new methods, new techniques, or is the other way around? So that is an interesting topic of discussion. I just want to bring here a quote, quotation by Sidney Brenner, Nobel Prize uh, um, in Physiology and Medicine, who said that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. So maybe he's right. I think laser field and a particular lasers applied in uh, heritage science uh, follow this approach. Uh, so that is an inter is interesting topic of of discussion, some food for thought. Uh, what I'm going to tell you in, in this uh, around half an hour uh, consists first in a, a reminder of what laser light is. And uh, some of you who are very familiar with this type of devices uh, will forgive me for, for very basic information. But I think we have to start by first things first. Then I will describe some uh, mechanisms that uh, rule laser materials interactions. I will then uh, speak about how lasers can modify and, and change properties of materials. And this is relevant for a very important application uh, of lasers in heritage science, that is laser cleaning. And I will end up by um, uh, describing some laser techniques for analysis, characterization, and online monitoring of uh, tangible uh, heritage. And of course, I will not be able during this time, during this, the time of this webinar, to describe all types of laser techniques and methodologies that are nowadays 
uh, use in the field of heritage science. I make a selection, so but there will be other um, uh, webinars in where some of these techniques, uh, some of the techniques will be described. So what is a laser? It's a device that generates an intense, coherent, highly directional and spectrally pure light beam uh, based on the uh, process of light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation that is schematized uh, here. Uh, you see in the picture uh, the first, the components of the first laser that was a solid state ruby laser uh, built by Mayman in 1960 and it already contains all the parts of the main parts of a laser device, uh, a laser medium uh, that generates and amplifies light, in this case it was a ruby crystal, the pumping source that provides uh, the initial energy to the medium, the resonator, an optical resonator consisting of a couple of mirrors that amplifies light and the output coupler. So this all, all lasers co consist in these elements, all lasers contain these elements. We can classify lasers uh, according to several criteria. For instance, what is the color of the light they emit, whether the pulses are short, long, or we have a continuous uh, wave laser, the, according to the power of the emission, or, or uh, as in the pictures here, according to the size, laser diodes, tiny laser diodes, or in the other extreme, the big infrastructures, big installations like the extreme light infrastructure. What are the main properties of laser light? Uh, one more, one that is very important is coherence and directionality. So um, in conventional light, uh, the electromagnetic light waves are out of, out of phase and this gives uh, rise to incoherent and light that is emitted in all directions. Uh, in, in contraposition, uh, in laser light, electromagnetic waves are in phase and this um, produces coherent, collimated and highly directional uh, light beams that are characteristics, uh, characteristic of laser, laser devices. Another uh, important property of laser light is the wavelength, uh, the color of the emission, and lasers can generate very pure uh, colors of light. Uh, you see here the electromagnetic spectrum from the ultraviolet to the infrared, where I have marked some of the most common laser systems that are used in the context of heritage science. The erbium jack laser, the neodymium jack laser that operate in the infrared. I have marked here the different harmonics of the neodymium jack laser that covers several wavelengths in the UV, excimer lasers in the UV as well, and the titanium sapphire infrared laser that is uh, used as an ultra short uh, pulse delivery source. Talking about ultra short, uh, we have to consider also the duration in pulse laser, the duration of the laser pulses. In the context of heritage science studies, apart from continuous wave lasers, we use lasers with pulses covering the, from the microsecond to the femtosecond uh, regimes. But think that nowadays uh, scientists, scientists are able to generate attosecond uh, pulse lasers, which is an amazing short, amazingly short uh, pulses of light. We have to consider um, that pulse laser consists of a train of pulses uh, and uh, we have to consider re the repetition rate and uh, we have also to think that uh, uh, to consider the, the peak power um, of, the, of these laser pulses and average power. These are important parameters for whatever concerns interaction with materials. We can have a laser with high peak power, pulse energy divided by pulse duration, but according to the repetition rate, the average power can be much lower. So this is important in order to see how the laser light affects the, the material. 
So all these properties that are common to all laser systems, uh, like uh, spatial coherence, spectral purity, co capacity of controlling pulse duration, spot size, polarization, and other parameters, are um, advantages for whatever concern heritage science uh, and heritage, ma heritage materials, because we can um, study these materials with increased 3D spatial resolution, because we can investigate, due to the capacity of controlling these parameters, we can investigate the atomic or molecular structure of these materials. We can study physical chemical interaction among components in complex uh, materials and exploit new optical uh, properties for characterization and analysis, as, I, as you will see at the end of, of my talk. And laser systems uh, are, can be developed as non-contact, non-invasive uh, tools for studying materials and objects, and uh, as portable and hyphenated uh, systems, which is uh, obviously an advantage, uh, uh, very convenient for studying precious artworks and, and heritage substrate or objects. So I'm talking about materials, and uh, I would like to say that heritage materials are somewhat uh, special. They are different from um, synthetic materials or from modern materials that we typically study in the laboratory. And why is that? Why heritage materials are special? Because uh, we find mixed composition, heterogeneous, uh, many components in a single substrate, like for instance here in this picture you see biodeterioration in a stone substrate. There are complex interactions due to matrix effects, aging, environmental degradation, etc. We usually or very often we found multi-layer, multi-scale uh, objects or, or materials uh, spanning from millimeter to nanometer spatial scales and the objects or the substrates are many times immovable and have an associated intangible, intangible values. So these are really special characteristics that pose a challenge for studying these materials with, with lasers. So uh, in what regards, sorry, what regards uh, how lasers interact with materials and what are the mechanisms we have to consider that they depend mainly, as couldn't be differently, of two set of parameters in this multi, in this complex multiparametric, sorry, multiparametric space. The laser parameters that I already mentioned, wavelength, um, pulse duration, fluence, polarization, etc., and the material properties, including chemical composition and other properties like optical, thermal, and mechanical. But as I said before, usually in, in heritage materials, we don't have a single component. We have several compounds or several materials mixed all together. So this is, is a complex space uh, in, the, in the interacting with uh, laser light. So I, I want to talk now a bit about mechanisms of uh, laser material interactions and I will start talking about laser ablation. Laser ablation is a complex uh, physical chemical process that uh, results in removing, removing material from a solid substrate by irradiating it with a laser beam, as in the scheme you see here. There, the, you, have, you may have a substrate with a contaminant layer. You focus the laser on top of the substrate as a of the interaction of material, particles, uh, neutron, uh, atoms, molecules, um, clusters, particulates is ejected, accompanied by a luminous emission. So this physical process of laser ablation is the mechanism behind uh, the application of laser cleaning in, in heritage, uh, in cultural heritage. Uh, that consists in the precise and controlled elimination of unwanted layers of different nature, their degraded material, etc. That is, and, uh, that is uh, carried out while at the same time preserving 
or that would be the aim, preserving the characteristics of the substrate, uh, texture, physical chemical properties, etc. So let me, uh, uh, and then, okay, so this is laser ablation. So what are the mechanisms be behind this process? Mm, there is a mixture of mechanisms uh, and, and the different contribution, the relative contribution depend on the material and depend on the characteristics of the laser. So, so when using infrared pulse lasers, we may, uh, the, the photothermal ablation mechanism could be predominant, but we may have a photomechanical ablation mechanism that uh, is, relies on plasma and shock wave formation. And when we are having ultraviolet pulse lasers, the photomechanical ablation mechanism that involves plasma formation and bone breaking can be the pre predominant one. So we may have a mixture according to the situation, according to the, to the problem. So laser cleaning is, is uh, a well-recognized and well-accepted uh, procedure in, in conservation and restoration of, of fireworks. And everything started with the problem of laser removal of black crust on architectural elements or sculptures in stone. Uh, the challenge here is to remove the black crust or where a stone substrate uh, and it is based in the more efficient absorption of photon energy by layers to be eliminated in comparison with those to be preserved. In the graph here you see the ablation rate, the amount of material we elim eliminate per laser pulse as a function of laser fluence, energy divided by uh, area of irradiation. And you see that the onset of elimination of the black crust is lower than the threshold for, of damaging the white, uh, in this case, marble, marble stone substrate. So we have here a safe range in where we eliminate uh, the crust without damaging the, the white marble. This is the, the idea of the self-limiting mechanism that has made this application laser removal of black crust so successful. Uh, and these are the mechanisms mainly involved in this, in this uh, application uh, that they re relies in the use of pulse infrared laser, lasers. Uh, there are examples in, in important um, restoration and conservation campaigns of important monument, monuments. I bring here a restoration campaign of a, in a portal of the of the Cathedral of Seville, where terracotta sculpture were cleaned with infrared laser, and the well-known approach by our Greek colleagues at the Fourth uh, in Greece, uh, in that in, in, that is based in the development of a infrared dual uh, wavelength blending approach for laser cleaning of uh, of marble. Uh, that uh, was applied for the cleaning of the Parthenon friezes or the cariatids in, in Parthenon. And they used this wavelength, uh, double wavelength approach to compensate the yellowing associated with the removal of black crusts. Other examples, uh, we have in Spain a lot of poly polychrome uh, substrates uh, that have been cleaned uh, that have been restored using infrared lasers. You see in the example here of poly, polychrome uh, sculptures with brocades uh, in relief. And it's uh, very important to, to bring here the example of laser cleaning of metal heritage. Um, our colleagues in, in, Siena, in, in Florence, uh, Salvatore Siano and collaborators, have um, developed uh, fundamental studies uh, on optimization of pulse duration for the infrared laser cleaning of uh, metal heritage and they undertook an uh, important campaign of restoration of the cleaning of the gates of paradise in the baptistery of Florence. Mm, uh, I have spoken about laser cleaning using infrared lasers but there is another set of uh, problems that can be uh, faced by using ultraviolet pulse lasers and this 
concern the um, cleaning of, of varnish layers uh, in, on paintings or thinning down the graded of polymerized, polymerized varnish, layer, varnish layers by pulse UV lasers. The idea here is to remove part of this degraded varnish, identify the safe conditions for varnish removal without modifying the underlying paint, the sensitive underlying paint underneath, uh, avoiding any type of photochemical activity or temperature increase, melting, etc. Here, I show you an example uh, of some study that we undertook on shellac uh, uh, varnish temperas. You see here the absorption spectrum of shellac uh, in front of two wavelengths in the UV. Uh, one is uh, poorly absorbed by the, by the shellac varnish, and the other one is strongly absorbed. So in the pictures here, you see uh, this the samples irradiated at this with laser at these two wavelengths. The upper part of, on top of the discontinuous line is it, the irradiated area, and the lower part is the non irradiated area of the varnish. And you see that the longer wavelengths, were, which is poorly absorbed by the, by the varnish, uh, produces some changes in the, in the texture, bubble formation in the, in the varnish. Whereas the wavelength, the, the, the pulse laser that which wavelength is strongly coupled with the with the varnish generates a very very pleasant, very adequate uh, thinning down of the varnish without without changing its texture or its morphology. So that shows the crucial role of optical absorption. There are a lot of model studies, uh, studies on real samples. A lot of activity uh, to understand and to identify the, the best conditions uh, in where pulse UV pulse lasers can be used for this application for removing the graded polymerized varnish on, on paintings. So um, laser cleaning based on laser ablation, but laser ablation is also the process and the mechanism behind a technique uh, well known. To many of you, uh, for that is used for characterization and analysis of uh, tangible heritage, is a laser spectroscopy that is known like laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy that relies on the spectroscopic analysis of the luminous ablation plasma. You remember that I told you that when you ablate material from a substrate. Uh, uh, luminous plasma is, is generated. So by spectroscopic analysis of this luminous plasma, we can uh, identify the atomic elemental composition of the, of the material we are removing. This technique uh, gives immediate response, has a stratigraphic capability because we can apply successive pulses over the same point of the sample, so we get uh, information about the different layers. It is minimally invasive because it results in the formation of a tiny crater on the surface and is amenable for in situ analysis and to, can be developed as portable instrument as uh, in, the, in the picture here and also can be combined with other laser spectroscopic techniques like, like laser induced fluorescence from Raman in a hyphenated uh, setups. I want to show you an example of the type of uh, spectra and the type of results that we can obtain using this technique. This is a study we undertook in a nice, a very nice object from the Al Andalus period. Uh, it's a, a bottle, metallic bottle, now in the Teruel Museum. And we, before restoration, we, we work on the characterization of, of the materials of the bottle. And you can see here a couple of uh, lip spectra uh, acquired in different points of the object, uh, revealing the composition that is uh, uh, silver and gold, and uh, in, in, in the soldering part between the two halves of the bottle, we see tin so, as, a, as material used for the soldering the two, the two halves of the, of the bottle. So 
as I said, uh, LIPS um, provides also capacity for stratigraphic analysis, as in the example here of a polychrome uh, uh, piece, in an uh, altar piece in a church in, in Zaragoza. You see the spectra after one, two, and three laser pulses. You see how the spectra changes, revealing different layers of paints in the polychrome. And in this study, we combine LIPS with Raman to confirm the nature of, of pigments and uh, in this particular example the green was uh, identified as emerald green as uh, uh, and as this pigment was synthesized first at the beginning of the first century clearly indicates that the uh, presence of emerald green is the result of uh, some restoration campaign because the original piece is from 18th century so enough about laser ablation <laughs> i want to talk about other properties other types of uh, laser materials interactions we are all very familiar with linear optical properties of materials reflection transmission transmission diffraction emission absorption and emission of light light scattering these processes are responsible for some of the techniques we are familiar with like for instance laser induced fluorescence that consists in the absorption and emission uh, from a molecular compound and uh, anal spectroscopic analysis of this emission serves to identify the, the material you know, we are we are having in, in our object or in our substrate uh, again uh, uh, here as i said in uh, leaf informs about the molecular composition differently from lips that tell us about elemental composition it shares a lot of uh, properties with uh, lips but in this case is totally non-invasive uh, uh, technique and uh, you see here uh, a laboratory setup that combines a hybrid leaf lips raman uh, this is a laboratory system but there are efforts by by some of the members of our consortium to develop a portable uh, hybrid leaf leaves raman setup so stay tuned because the, this will be opening a lot of possibilities for studying uh, materials and objects i want to show you an example of how we apply laser induced fluorescence for studying for characterizing um, gris eyes in historical glasses uh, gris eyes are blackish brown vitreous paints uh, used for decoration and symbolic representation since medieval times and uh, production involves uh, grounding uh, different uh, metallic oxides with uh, uh, flux of lead ground glass so we we had a very nice collection of uh, samples from historical glasses of, of different chronologies and provenances and we collected uh, laser induced fluorescence spectrum spectra that allowed us to uh, identify uh, the contribution of different emissions uh, due to the glass flux and to different metallic oxides that were used for for making this this gris age and with different contributions of these uh, components for each of the of the samples that we studied so i think that was quite nice uh, example is a quite nice example of the application of laser induced fluorescence that has been applied to many other types of substrate pigments uh, many other components so linear properties but uh, there are also other type of properties that are called non-linear optical properties and what is this um, maybe you are familiar with the generation of harmonics in the uh, in fact the not the first non-linear effect was second harmonic generation in a ruby crystal look that it was just one year after the fabrication of the first ruby laser so nonlinear optics has been around as long as the lasers have been around and these nonlinear effects appear when the optical field is large enough uh, to generate a appreciable contribution of these uh, nonlinear effects in fact we describe this but in terms of the polarization that is induced in the material by application of, of light 
and this polarization can be developed as a series uh, in where the linear terms uh, account for the well-known linear effects or refraction absorption the ones i mentioned before and higher order uh, corrections are nonlinear effects so why i want to tell you about nonlinear optics because this is uh, the basis of a new family of techniques recently implemented in, uh, in characterization and study of heritage substrates, that is nonlinear optical microscopy, a family of techniques initially developed in the biomedical field uh, and implemented in a heritage uh, field, and is based on the near infrared ultrafast laser excitation to exploit nonlinear optical properties for high contrast imaging of uh, substrates and objects. These techniques offer a 3D spatial resolution for non-destructive, accurate determination of structural details of our substrate, such as thickness and composition uh, within multi-layer, multi-material samples. You see here an example of application for imaging pigments and support in papers and textiles, a very nice example of the application of this family of techniques in multimodal in a multimodal approach. So uh, the basics of this uh, uh, technique is uh, the interaction interaction of a near infrared ultra short femtosecond laser with a transparent material. Uh, uh, focus the laser light is focused with a high numerical aperture objective lens inside the material and in the focal region uh, a, a, a bunch of nonlinear optical signals are, are generated we can scan the either the laser or move the the, the substrate to uh, generate signals to to scan all the the region of, of the of the material of the substrate and uh, some of the signals that we can generate some of the most important ones are, are schematized here together with the fluorescence that i discussed before when talking about laser induced fluorescence um, you have multi-photon excitation fluorescence that is related to the chemical composition so multi-photon excitation signal tell us about chemical composition of the substrate, second harmonic generation that signpost the presence of crystalline or uh, structures, highly oriented or hierarchical structures, for instance, collagen and others. And also, uh, I schematize here third harmonic generation that marks local differences uh, between materials of different optical properties and so signpost position of interface in multi-layer substrates. Mm, what is important here is the multimodal advantage because we generate we can generate all these signals uh, in the same measuring event and obtain a lot of uh, complementary compositional structural information with 3d resolution micrometer resolution and in a non-destructive uh, way an example uh, of application of the multi multi photon excitation fluorescence modality is shown here for the case of the grease eyes I presented before. Here we have how the signal, the multi-photon excitation fluorescence signal, uh, changes with the depth we are exploring in the in the glass substrate. And this uh, analysis of this depth profile allows us to determine the thickness of the grease eye paints. Uh, that we compare with uh, measurements taken by scanning electron uh, microscopy. You see that the agreement is good with the fantastic advantage of this technique that is non-destructive, whereas in the case of uh, scanning electron microscopy, we have to take samples and prepare cross sections. So that is an example of uh, the convenience of using or the capabilities of, of using these techniques. Uh, Nonlinear optical microscopy has been used um, uh, for studying many types of uh, heritage substrate, varnish and paint layers, corrosion layers of metallic artifacts, parchment, and even historical uh, real, real objects. And there are a lot of applications 
in where different modalities of nonlinear microscopy uh, and in combination with other more conventional techniques have been undertaken um, to study a, a wide range of uh, substrates and, and materials. So I think that is enough <laughs> up to now, and I would like to conclude um, by saying that application of fundamental knowledge of materials or material uh, laser materials interaction and spectroscopy uh, has allowed to develop and apply um, different kinds of approaches, advanced methodologies for laser cleaning that offer control action of removal an absence of damage to the underlying substrate. In the case of laser uh, cleaning of, of the great advantage, optical absorption is key parameter, is a key parameter. And um, techniques such as laser induced fluorescent leaves, nonlinear optical microscopy, and other methods that I didn't have the time to discuss, uh, sometimes in multi analytical approaches and or portable. Um, systems serve for non-invasive or minimally invasive determination of a structure and composition. LIPS is developed as a commercial technique nowadays and is available for in situ elemental analysis of works of art, the archaeological remains, the great degradation of modern materials. Mm, LIF uh, allows uh, studies of binding media, pigment degradation, coloring agents, Etc., drawing on fundamental studies of molecular spectroscopy. And I wanted to present you at the end a nonlinear optical microscopy that, together with laser Raman spectroscopy, serves for depth profiling because laser Raman has also this capability of depth profiling for non invasive stratigraphic analysis of essential importance for the non invasive characterization of complex layers such as those found in works of art. And I want to finish by some acknowledgements, a couple of um, commercials, and then I will give the word to Matilla. Uh, my acknowledgements go to many of my collaborators uh, in many places, especially in my institute, in my institution and in Spain, and uh, my colleagues, my dear colleagues in Greece and Italy, and many others that uh, there is no space in this transparency to, to present. Uh, the commercials go to, because some of the techniques I presented here are available in, uh, in the catalog of services of the Imperial NHS. So you have the transnational access possibilities to three platforms. Um, there are periodic calls and the next one will, uh, the deadline is uh, 30th April, April. So I I encourage you to browse the catalog and apply for for time, and 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 then sorry, and then Matia, the word is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marta. This was such an enjoyable talk, and evidently a talk that was appreciated by many, because I think that we've had consistently about 220 participants, which is an amazing number.